Good afternoon, East Coasters, and good morning, West Coasters. I've seen a lot of people from all over the world, and I hope everyone is enjoying our first day of Gaming Fest. It's so far been an exciting morning with discussions on real-time game technology in the field of design and visualization. I'm Sue Ann Fu, the Chair of Interactive Design and Game Development here at SCAD. SCAD has an award-winning game development program that we are very proud of for the student accomplishments and the support of the alumni community. Part of that innovation has to do with our leverage of new technologies coupled with design and production excellence. Our speaker today is no stranger to innovation and will be talking about the ease of using Quixel Megascans and Unreal Engine's companion applications allowing artists to make high fidelity environments for various industries from film and television, architecture, mixed reality, and of course, game development. He is a veteran of the industry and have a legacy of working in several areas of the entertainment world, such as feature film animations and art direction in game development, and as a leader in game education. Please welcome the man of the hour and be prepared to be on full download of information for this hour, the guru of how you can tap into Unreal Engine's power. Here with us today is Epic Games Quixel lead evangelist, Louis Cataldi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for welcoming me to Game Fest. Um, it's been a while since I've joined you all at SCAD, but not that long. Um, hopefully, some of you remember I used to uh, be at SCAD a lot and uh, walk the halls and teach and uh, enjoy all my time there and hang out with Sue Ann and many of the faculty there. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be back working with you all. So. Uh, we have got a tremendous amount of material to cover today, and I hope that you're all excited to jump into working with the uh, Quixel ecosystem as well as Unreal Engine and all the amazing things that Epic Games is bringing. Uh, <clears throat> I hope you realize that all of this content and everything that I'm going to share with you is completely available to everyone for free from Epic Games. As long as you have an Epic ID, uh, just go if you don't have one and sign up and, you know, get it because it's all completely amazing and completely for free. Certainly through SCAD, uh, you know that you have access to it because SCAD embraces all this stuff. Uh, and a lot of it is really changing the world. So we're going to jump in because we've got a lot of material to cover. Uh, are we ready to go, Sue Ann? Is, are we good to go? It's all yours, Lewis. Can't all wait. Right, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and share a screen. And I'm going to share this screen here. And so... In the next little while, it is my goal to try and show you all how you can assemble something like this, which is kind of more of more than a gameplay environment, sort of a virtual production type of an environment. Uh, and what I mean by that is something that you might create a cinematic scene in. Uh, and my goal is to sort of show you how you can build something like this very quickly by trying to build as much as possible right in front of your eyes, or at least cooking show it, right? To show you how this is assembled very quickly through using Quixel Bridge, Quixel Mixer, you know, and a couple of blueprints that allow you to assemble things like this. Now, I'm also going to uh, cheat quite a bit because there are some systems in here like runtime virtual textures, which are systems inside of Unreal Engine. And if time permits, I'll actually bring in some of the new crazy stuff that uh, Epic is bringing for free to everyone and will emerge in the next couple of weeks, months, uh, undisclosed time frame, which include, of course, uh, metahumans. And see if I can sneak one into this scene and actually connect it through Live Link to my phone. And, you know, time permitting, we'll see if we can get one to talk to us. Uh, and then maybe even, uh, if time permits, bring in the Meerkat, which was another uh, demo that we had, and have the Meerkat pop into the scene and make an appearance into the scene. So once again, this is a convergence of a great many things to try and pull off in the next hour to 90 minutes. We'll see how it all tur turns out. At, at the very least, like any good cooking show, uh, at the very end, I'll bring the pie out of the oven and we'll all at least be able to savor the goodness or the mediocreness or whatever we end up with. Hopefully not the mediocreness. So 
Before we begin, let's talk a little bit about the company that I currently work with, which is, you know, a a part of Epic Games, right? I spent six years working uh, directly for Unreal Engine, uh, teaching Unreal all over the world. It took me to Moscow, Australia, Argentina, Buenos Aires, uh, Kuala Lumpur, Vietnam, you know, where I got to, just like SCAD, uh, stand in front of students just like yourselves and professors and teach Unreal Engine and teach people how to teach Unreal Engine. And recently in the last couple of months, just because of what Quixel is doing, I was really impassioned uh, to join that team uh, and to take over uh, many of the evangelism efforts because of the interest uh, and the power of photogrammetry and what that means. Because as many of you know, uh, you can let me minimize this. You can open up Unreal Engine and like many powerful tool sets like Unreal Engine, you know, you have the power to do anything, including make a game like Fortnite, uh, which is made in Unreal Engine, or make a movie or a TV show like The Mandalorian. But in and of itself, Unreal Engine doesn't really have any content, right? There's no stuff in it. You know, yes, there's some spheres and you can make materials and you can make blueprints and you can light things and you can do amazing things with it. But in and of itself, it does not really have any content. So one of the reasons that Epic Games acquired Quixel is because Quixel does have stuff. It's got lots and lots of stuff. Uh, And the way that Quixel gets stuff is that it goes out and scans the world. And we have teams all over the world that are constantly scanning the world, right? And if you go to the Quixel website, for those of you who are not familiar with what Quixel is, uh, you go to Quixel.com and you go to the products and you can go to the Megascans library here. And you can take a look and start browsing the library. And this takes you basically to the Megascans browser. And you can see that in the library, there are nearly 15,000 assets in here. And I'll, you know, take a few minutes to just familiarize you with what this is. But I'm going to do it in a different tool, right? Because if I take one step back here in my browser, we can go back to just quixel.com here. Uh, Let's take one step back here. We'll let it come all the way back. And you can see that in the product section, there are a couple of other things. There's Quixel Bridge and Quixel Mixer. These are two free tools, Bridge and Mixer. And you can go and download these, once again, completely for free. And so. Having said that, I'm going to open up one of these tools called Quixel Bridge. And now Quixel Bridge, if we take a look at it, looks just like the Megascans library through a browser. However, it is much more powerful. And I want to just share with you some of the power of Bridge, because one of the things that you can do with Quixel Bridge is connect it directly to Unreal Engine. And with one click of a button, take any one of these 14,957 assets and push it directly into Unreal Engine, which is in many ways how I very quickly assembled this scene. And so when you open up Quixel Bridge, you log into it by coming up here and you sign in, and you sign in with your Epic ID, right? It's the same Epic ID that you use to sign into Unreal Engine, and and in many cases, the same Epic ID that you could play Fortnite with or go and get your free games or your free marketplace assets from the, the Epic Games launcher. Uh, and you log in, and whereas before Epic acquired Quixel, you had to go and use you know a significant number of resources. In other words, you had to pay a subscription, which could be fairly costly, to access points to download this content. Now with your Epic ID, all of this stuff is completely free to use inside of Unreal Engine. I know, ridiculous. But here we are inside of the home page of Quixel Bridge, and you can see that we have basically right at your fingertips all of these collections. And what you see here is all the new surfaces that are available to you. You see all the new 3D assets, and all of this content is brought to you through photogrammetry. None of this stuff is made by artists, it's all processed by artists, but all of this stuff is captured through a proprietary process of capturing it through photogrammetry at a very high level of quality and detail. And it includes tons of 3D models, tons of 3D plants of all different types, foliage. 
And then we store it in different types of collections. So if you need urban trash, here's all kinds of urban trash because the library is big enough for us, not you know, for you not to be able to always identify specifically what you're looking for. So we make it easier for you to get to the content. And then we also share with you different types of assets, but also the trending assets. What are the people right now going and pulling down most frequently? So you can see what everyone's going to get. Once again, the latest surfaces, the latest 3D models, and so forth. But then you can also go and just look at 3D assets per classification. And when you look at this left sidebar, and I've got this little hotkey that I can push on my keyboard, and let you see more clearly what I'm looking at here. You can look at food, historical, 3D assets, uh, industrial, interior, nature, so forth. And so we can sort of dig down and look more closely at, you know, props that are farm props, fire props, recreational, wheels, so forth. And so we really get to dig down and find what we're looking for more easily. Now, at any given point, when you find something you might be interested in, you know, maybe we want some barrels. All games need barrels of one kind or another. And maybe you have to keep in mind that, once again, because you used your Epic ID to sign on, all of this content, you can download it, right? Uh, but the issue is, is that we all, you know, even though hard drives are fairly affordable these days, you can download 8K textures for a lot of this content. So your hard drive will get filled up pretty quickly. So you don't need to download it all. In many cases, you can just favorite it. So if you like something you see here, you can say, well, you know, this looks pretty interesting. You can hit the little favorite, and now it's stored and available to you down here in the favorites. And so it becomes a lot easier to favorite things. Let's say you're working with a team, and the team says, well, go and find a bunch of, you know, cliffs or and maybe a, a bunch of dried grass. Well, then you can go and favorite a bunch of cliffs and dried grass and then come back here and show them all the things that you favorited before you actually have to pull them down and fill your hard drive full of this content. So keep that in mind that you can favorite all the content that you want. And so that can be really handy to be aware of. And then you'll see a couple of other icons here. You'll see the download icon. So if you see something that you want, you can just one click and download it directly from the uh, identifier icon here. And then once you've downloaded it, and I'll come down here to the things in my local repository, things that I've already downloaded, you'll see that that'll turn blue. So now there'll be a blue icon here that says, I've already pulled this down into my local repository. And so now I have the ability, once I set up my export settings, to use one click to export it directly to my Unreal Engine project. Uh, so that workflow makes life a lot easier and very, very helpful. So to go back to the types of things that are available to everyone, of course, you've got 3D assets and 3D assets, once again, we all know for the most part, but let's talk a little bit about what type of 3D assets are available to us, right? If I click on any given asset in the library, you're going to see a pop-out panel come out to the right side here. And a lot of metadata is going to come up here that can be really helpful to be aware of. For one, many of these icons, it's kind of hard to know how big some of this stuff is. Well, if we take a look over here on the right side, you'll see that we've got a little size chart. And you'll see that that's a little person right here. And then that's the size of the asset. So if I click on a different one, now you see that there's the person and the size of the asset. So this can be really helpful. And not downloading a rock or, you know, a boulder and expecting it to be the size of, you know, a pebble and then actually getting something that's uh, massive, you know, the size of a, a Volkswagen Beetle instead. Another important piece of metadata is whether the asset is open or closed. You'll see that there are many things that are don't have a closed bottom or a closed back because the intention is for this asset to be pushed into a piece of terrain or to be pushed into the ground or something. Uh, so we actually will not close the bottom or the back of it. Whereas there are many that actually are closed, right? So you'll see that in this case, these tree debris are closed and they can be flipped and rotated any way you want and you will never see an opening on the back. 
right? So you'll see here the snowy ground is open because it's intended to be pushed into uh, another mesh or a ground bit. And then you'll see that there's, it's part of an assembly. There's a whole collection of other assets that fit with it, which we will put down here below. And then we'll also put the whole collection below. So that can be really helpful to be aware of all this uh, metadata that's available per asset. Another thing that's really helpful is to know that this is not just a static window here on the top right. You can always go and expand it and get a much closer view of what you're looking at. So maybe you're building a snowy environment and you wanna see whether this thing is gonna be of value to you, but you can always click up here on the top left to see what the actual textures look like. And you'll see in the lower left that you can look at the albedo texture. Everything in here is based on physically based rendering so that you'll have displacement, you'll have the normal that you can look at, the roughness, the transmission, and back to the albedo. But you'll also be able to actually look at a 3D model of this thing and use your middle mouse and left mouse to pan around it. And you can actually hold down the shift key and your right mouse button and change the lighting inside of any one of these viewports. So that can be really handy. Now, another thing that's really handy is that we only allow you to zoom in and look at the variety of resolutions for any 3D asset that you have not downloaded yet. But given that you've actually downloaded the piece of content, like whatever I have here in my local repository, I can actually get much closer to it. So if I open up, for instance, this Japanese stone lantern and expand my viewport here, I can take a look at what it actually looks like and it's going and fishing it out of my hard drive. And here's the actual image of it. And if I go to the texture set, I can now go once again and look at all the textures for it. But when I go to the 3D representation of it, I can now orbit around it and now I can zoom in much, much closer because I've already downloaded this asset. And now I can actually look at it in all the different shading models or, or surface models for it, as well as the wireframe of it. So this can be really handy as I want to examine what this asset will look like. But I can not only look at it in 3D for the zeroth LOD, I can look at it in 3D for all the level of details that are available to me. So this is the high resolution version of it. And I can step down to the LOD2 and I can go down to the lowest level of detail mesh. So if I want to bring this in as a whole level of detail set, maybe I'm making a virtual reality experience and I want something that's much lower in resolution, I can even go back and turn this on with full PBR mode and see how this will hold up. And once again, holding down my shift key, I can pan the light around and see if my silhouette actually holds up from the zeroth LOD to the final LOD, right? So if any popping is gonna occur. So that can be really helpful. Additionally, I can look to see down here at the highest resolution texture that's available for it. So here's the 4K texture on the zero at LOD. This is nearly as good as this asset gets for download. And you can see that's a pretty nice looking asset. So just be aware that once you download, you get to really examine all of these assets. Once again, if you are looking at a surface, you can look at a surface as a sphere. And once again, you can look at it in all the different view modes for your textures, and you can look at it in 4K, 2K, and 1K, which can be really handy. Now, something that also is important to, to be aware of is that once we start making a distinction as to what we're looking at, everything that you download from the Megascans library has a kind of a different breakdown as to what you get, right? So you get your 3D assets, but once we start getting into surfaces, which are basically tiling surfaces. And this can be really important for those of you who are on, on the game development side. All of these surfaces, the metadata that's of value here is whether it tiles in one direction or two, and what's the tiling size, right? So here's a two meter by two meter tiling surface. 
And so if you're trying to maintain texel density for your textures, you want to make sure that you're constantly bringing down like tiling surfaces, right? So here's a one meter by one meter. Here's a one meter by one meter. And here's a two meter by two meter. So you want to be careful that you're not pulling down different size textures and trying to put them on top of each other uh, and expecting them to tile at the same resolution. So just be aware that this metadata is available to you as, as well as whether it will tile only in one direction like this one here or in two directions like this one here. Additionally, just be aware of what you get, right? So on surfaces, you get albedo, normal, cavity, roughness, and surface. But once we get down here to the decals, and these decals are super powerful because when you export them into Unreal Engine, it comes in with the full material that you can push this. So if you've got a full wall that you've built in Unreal Engine, you get a material that also has a uh, pixel depth offset. So if I select, for instance, this, um, you know, a, a, a train track and I want to download it, I can look at the renders, but if I go and look at the materials, you'll see that I get only the AO, the displacement, the normal, the opacity, and the roughness. So it's a different texture set than I would if I was downloading a surface. So just be aware of that. Atlases are different as well. Atlases give you a whole different texture set because you're going to use it in a different way. The same thing with imperfections. Imperfections are really powerful because this is what you would use to do leakages or, or stains on a surface. Uh, and this you might blend purely as a material. All right, so uh, that's a lot of information about how to access the library. Once again, there's so much content in here that you can go into the search bar and say, I want, uh, I want maybe, you know, an old uh, wooden, and I can say old barrel. And I want it to be wood, not good, but wood. Let's see. Let's let's just do concrete. Oops, got to type it. Uh, and I want it to be old. I want it to be brown. And I want it to be um, damaged. So, you know, that's one way to start sort of isolating old damaged concrete, right? And the other way to do it is to come up here and just instead of actually typing it out, you can actually do it in the same way by selecting, you know, I want a 3D asset. I want it to be one meter by 2.4 meters. I want it to be, you know, damaged and I want it to be, uh, you know, forest. And then you can even on top of that type in here what you want in your search bar. So just be aware that the search function is very powerful. Now. Uh, let's jump into what you do to get some of this content into the engine. Now, you can do this either in the edit drop down, or you can do it here in this little gear icon down at the bottom. And here I've got download settings and I've got export settings. Let's go to the export setting. Now, if I go to the export setting, I can go to tell bridge to export to Unreal Engine, of course. I can go to Max Maya. Of course, Using Bridge and all of this content for free works with Unreal Engine. It does not, the, the EULA, the user license agreement, does not cover the use of 15,000 assets for Max, Maya, Blender, Unity, or anything else. If you're going to log in here and, and get access to all this stuff, the user license agreement covers Unreal Engine, and that's one of the stipulations. So be aware of that. So, one of the things also is to be aware that. You want to plug it, you need to install the plugin. So the plugin is available from directly within Bridge. Okay, so you just point to your engine folder where the engine is installed and it tells you where it is. And in you know, many cases, it's where you've got Unreal Engine installed. For me, it's installed not in my local C drive, but I've got a, an E drive uh, where I've got Unreal Engine installed. So there it is. And then you install the plugin and you get a notification that it's installed. So be aware of that. And then you go and do your presets. 
And one of the things that's really powerful about exporting directly from within Bridge is that you can channel pack from within Bridge, right? So if you don't want all your textures to all go into RGB, you can say, I want my green channel to have my curvature or my cavity map or my displacement or my gloss or my fuzz. So just be aware that Bridge does support full channel packing and that can be really helpful. Hey, Louis, I don't want to interrupt your uh, flow of thought, but uh, before we go too far in the demo, I just have uh, two quick questions uh, from the audience, and I would like to uh, see if I could just pass it along while it's still uh, in sure. the moment of the demo. Um, Professor Prada is asking, what is the standard uh, resolutions that you're using for texture maps uh, in the earlier portion that you were showing? And also following that similar thought, um, uh, Alexis Harrington is also asking if uh, they should use a 4K over a 2K texture. Those are great questions. So if you select anything in particular, you'll see that by the time you're ready to download or export, you get the option down here to define what resolution you're going to be working in. In some cases, you can download 2K, 4K, and all the way up to 8K uh, for textures. Now, if you're going to pull down something, you know, let's go, for instance, to the 3D assets and we go to, you know, a trash bag or, or moreover, a piece of fruit, right? And you pull down an 8K texture, oh, well, it's not available for this. You have to remember that in Unreal Engine, everything gets MIPPed. So what that means is that um, the, uh, the engine creates level of detail textures like it creates level of detail meshes. And in order for you to see a full 4K resolution texture for something as small as an apple, you literally would have to be holding it right up to your virtual eyeball. By the time you get an arm's length in Unreal Engine, you're probably looking at the fifth or sixth MIP of a texture, which means you're not looking at 4K resolution anymore. You're probably looking at 512 or, or 256. So it's not always in your best interest for a small asset to pull down the highest resolution texture because you're wasting texture memory. So the engine actually has, Unreal Engine actually has a streaming texture resolution, a way to actually look at that. So I can actually go into my view modes and look at, where is it? Uh, my streaming resolution density, uh, which one of these is it? Material texture scale. I think it has to build it. Uh, it's going to take a minute. Material texture scale. It's one of these view modes, and it'll actually show you all of your uh, texture densities. Uh, it's one of these. I don't want to actually get sidetracked to show up, but look it up in the documentation because, once again, you don't want to be displaying a resolution or you don't want to import resolutions that you're going to waste all your texture memory and you won't see it anyway. So that's the answer to that question. Uh, the other answer to the question is you have full control over the resolution and some assets will actually offer you the opportunity to download 8K and it depends on how you set up a pipeline. Um, we just had a meeting with a, a huge game studio. Of course, they download the highest resolution they can because internally, they process all the textures in their digital content creation tools, and then they import into engine um, textures, and then they let any files control what gets processed. But Unreal Engine is going to process your textures for you. So you have to, once again, just keep an eye on this little section down here at, at what's available to you. If I select this, it's going to say, well, ah, you got an 8K that's available to you. Do you want an 8K or do you not want an 8K? And the reason for that is, because in your export settings, not only can you download or export super high resolution textures, you can also, here in the, in the model section, export high poly source, which means that if you're making a cinematic experience or a virtual production movie, you can export the highest resolution poly model 
you know, including ZBrush models and so forth that go into the engine. So you can see that if I go to my export or download settings for models here, I can export high poly source and source for ZBrush tools. So in many cases, we prepare all that content for most, most of the stuff because everything that gets brought in and processed by our team in Pakistan goes through a ZBrush process. So just be aware of that. Any other immediate questions before uh, I keep talking as fast as my mouth will move? Um, there's just a quick question on one more uh, that's uh, asking about uh, sometimes uh, things come in with their own LODs. Which level uh, should be used for the scene, say, for real-time visualization? I think that um, a lot of that is set. It depends on the project. You know, many questions are answered with the time-tested answer, it depends. Uh, there is no one answer. It depends on what your project is doing. It depends on how big your scene is. It depends on uh, how many players. It depends on what your current frame rate goals are. It depends on a lot of things, right? So it depends. It depends on whether... Um, if your frame rate's good, uh, you don't, you know, putting in more level of detail meshes is only going to bloat your memory. Uh, if your frame rate's bad, maybe you need more LODs. We go to professional studios and they don't have any level of detail meshes and they're like, why is our frame rate so bad? You know, where did you learn game development? You know, do you not realize you need level of detail meshes? Uh, so, uh, you know, we can export up to eight level of detail meshes that's a lot of meshes to put in and we don't always need eight level of detail meshes that the engine will make four level of detail meshes for you uh, or five, you know, so uh, that's too many sometimes. So you don't, you know, I personally will uncheck most of these and we'll, we'll take two or three, but you know, it depends is the time tested answer. What do you need? How big is your project? How many characters? How many static meshes? What type of lighting are you using? Is it VR, AR? Is it mobile? Is it console? It depends. Great answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm going to move off of bridge uh, after I show you how to pass an asset from it really quickly. Is there any immediate questions? No, I think we're actually set right now. Okay. So let's move one thing over so you can actually see the process run. So I'm going to go to my export settings. I'm going to go to um, default project, and I'm going to say I'm going to go to my Quixel demos, and this is where my Quixel demo is, and I just point to the project, and I think that's a 4.2. I don't remember which one it is. Let me see. It is a – got to look. 4.26 project. So I'll change that to 4.26. And so let's say I go to my local collection and I want to bring over this little shrine. All I have to do is push export and it should start coming over. There it comes. That's how fast it is to bring something into the engine. All of this content was brought in. You're always going to get this little normal thing. And there it is. And it's available to me right now. Now, the engine, once the plugin is installed, you get the Megascan plugin where you can actually create blended materials, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I don't want to get into it right now. There's documentation available to you that shows you how to create blended materials. But there is a material instance that's created for you that is pretty consistent, that allows you to do things like modify roughness. So if I want to come in here and modify the roughness of this thing, you know, I can change the roughness intensity automatically, make it, you know, more shiny, more rough. I can change the tiling. I can change um, the normal strength. So if you want the normal to be more intense, um, I can put a detailed normal. I can go in and change things. And you can always find the master material in your master material library and actually see how the master material works. So this is really great. And that's how I brought in all of the content in this level. I brought it in just with one click. Okay, so 
Now, having said that, let's talk about what this level is made up of and how it starts. The way that this level starts is that I begin just by making a new level, and I use the time of day. And I use the time of day in 4.26 because it already has some cool stuff in it that, that's really helpful. And I get rid of some things. I get rid of the floor because I don't need the floor. And I get rid of the uh, big sphere in the center. And I get rid of all this text because I don't need the text render. And I don't need the other text render. And I might get rid of the player start and put that in there. But I keep some other things that are kind of nice. It already comes with volumetric clouds. So these are really fantastic. These are fully volumetric, you know. Look at those clouds. And these are fully editable. You can go in and modify the material. So you can double click on the material and you have all these parameters that you can edit already, right? So you can change all kinds of stuff. You know, look at the erosion strength of the clouds and the scale. And you can do a lot of really cool stuff. So I was already playing around with fully volumetric clouds. And if you want to go fly up into the clouds, you can fly up into the clouds. If you hold Control L, you can change the lighting direction. Get some really nice, look at that, volumetric lighting effects into the, the light. So that's fantastic. Now, another thing that I did is I went into my plugin settings and I enabled Landmass, another really powerful tool. Landmass allows you to build terrains really easy and very powerful. So once you enable Landmass, you can create, by changing the modes here, a landscape. And I don't want to make anything too terribly big, but if I come in here and I change maybe to a 127 by 127 quad, you know, if I already want to make it dense so that I can work really, I'm going to keep it 63 and I'm going to maybe make it four by four so that it's small. And I'm going to make it actually even smaller, scale it down to five by five. So if I hit the F key to zoom in on it, it's a fairly small terrain patch. And I'm going to come up here to the top and right up here at the top and ne enable edit layers and then say create. And so that is going to expose for me this little blueprint right up here. And when I click on that, I can now use the landmass blueprint brush. And of course, since my terrain is really tiny, I want to scale this down. And I'm going to move my light up so that it isn't so dark here. There we go. And here's my landmass brush. Now, this is really powerful stuff. I can push that into the ground a little bit. Not too terribly much. And now I've got this suite of powerful tools at my disposal. I can cap the shape. I can change the fall off down to something like 24. If you reduce the width. And if I come down here, I'm going to turn blur off and zero it out. And I'm going to change my curl noise to five. And look at that. I can start to get some interesting curl noise. And I'm going to change my curl strength to something like 6.5. I'm going to change my tiling down to, I don't know, something like 1.5 so that it's not so crazy. Actually, maybe I'll change that to like 12 and this down to 1.5 so that I can start building some interesting terrain bits. And I'll change my smoothing uh, maybe to 75 so that it's just not too crazy and violent. And you can see this is all non-destructive, right? I can move it around anywhere I want. As a matter of fact, I can right click and add spline points and make it more detail. 
wherever I want. And I can actually go in and change the terracing. So I can change the terracing uh, and make the alpha for the terracing something like four or five so that there's some internal tur turbulence and make the spacing on the tur terracing a little lower or higher. So, you know, by the time I finished with all of the stuff that I did to the landmass, this is where I ended up. So I'm not going to save any of that stuff. This is kind of where I ended up with that. And then it came time to make a terrain material for it. And that's where I actually went into the next tool that's available from Quixel, which is called Quixel Mixer. Now, I know I'm going really fast. Is there any questions really quickly before uh, I jump into Quixel Mixer? Let me preface this by saying that uh, if you're going to ask questions about Nanite and Lumen or Unreal Engine 5, you're just going to have to hold off a little bit. Because if I answer those questions, there's a, a hit squad from Epic that's going to come and find me. And uh, then they're going to come and find you after they find Sue Ann. You're muted, Sue Ann, I think, somehow. Sorry, I was going to say we're fine, Lewis. We're uh, just uh, okay. absorbing it in. Cool. So now to make a terrain uh, material, I'm going to go in and use Quixel Mixer. Now, um, Quixel Mixer is very powerful. There's, it shares a lot of similarities with uh, Substance Paint or Substance Designer. But what one of the things that I think is really cool about it is that if you know Photoshop, you know a lot about Quixel Mixer because it shares a lot of paradigms with uh, Photoshop in that it's got layers and it's got masks and it's got a lot of the same kind of workflows. Now, I'm going to open up the finished material that I used on the terrain. Now, one of the things that's really powerful is that you can work in 2D or 3D inside of here, which is really cool. So I spent a few minutes working on a terrain in here material and i'll open it up and for the sake of time i'll open up the finished layers that i used for it as opposed to constructing it from the bottom up from scratch because that would take probably time that would take away from looking at metahumans and control rig and things like that so this is a procedural non-destructive uh texture set in here that is viewed as a material in essence and you can see that in the setup section of it I've got my working resolution, which I can pump up to 8K, but 4K is fine. I can work once again in, in 2D in a plain view or in 3D as an asset, but I can also bring in custom meshes in here and work on my own meshes. And then I can also define my size. But if I go into the layer stack, you'll see all the bits and pieces that make this thing up. I've got a base layer, and my base layer is just a base color. And all of them share sort of the same thing. They share that physically based uh, albedo, metalness, roughness, displacement, normal, opacity, curvature um, stack. And one of the very first things I added, and what I'm going to do is get rid of the ones that I'm not using, so I'm not tempted to turn them on. Okay, so, and then I'll turn off the ones that I'm, so that we can look at them one at a time. So I started with this clay. Now, moving around Mixer is just a matter of holding down the Alt key. I can zoom in and out using my middle mouse button. I'm using my left mouse button to orbit around. I'm looking at the scene currently in PBR mode, but I can look at it in albedo. I can look at it in metalness. I can look at it in normal. And that all corresponds to the keys on your keyboard, right? So if you want to look at all the different PBR modes, you can look at it by hitting the keys on your keyboard. And you can look at it in orthographic. I can look at it on a cube, a plane, you know, all the typical things you would see in a, a typical application like this. If I hit the T key, I can tile. And if I hit the shift left or right mouse button, I can move the light around and sort of see how it's affecting the environment. And it's got a really nice, you know, very visual, deep viewport so I can see the scene. 
and you know how intense it is. Now, as I'm looking here at the clay on the right side, I get a lot of really valuable information. Now, this is a surface that I pulled in. At the top, I've got three tabs. I've got my local library. This is all stuff that is currently in my local repository. <clears throat> and this is shared with Bridge. So everything that I see in my local Bridge library, I see in my local Mixer library. And then just like in Bridge, I can see the entire Megascans library based on my um, Epic login, right? So the same login I use to log into Unreal Engine, I have full access to the entire, you know, 14,900 and blah, blah, blah assets in here. I can search, I can look at the different categories and so forth. So what I did is I found a surface. This is a surface, which is called tie clay and it's two by two meters. And what I can do is look at the albedo of it, the metalness and the roughness, but now I get a couple of other things. I get the height frequency and I get the placement. All right, and what I can do is offset it if I want to offset it in either direction. I can rotate it so you can see how that works. <clears throat> I don't want to rotate it. I don't want to offset it. I can check, change the scale, right? So that's really handy. And then I get uh, the ability to actually change the frequency. So you can see that if I zoom in close, I can change the frequency of the actual texture and the low frequency, right? So that's really handy as well if I want to define the low and high frequencies of a texture. And that's based on my, my <clears throat> displacement sets here. So I can reset that and set that to one. And then I can change the overall thresholds and that's set to six. <clears throat> and then I can actually go in and change <clears throat> the colors, excuse me, of the albedo. So the PBR works really, really well. And I can go in and change the roughness of all this stuff. So if I want things to be really, you can see how at a glancing angle it gets really rough or not so rough. So that can be really helpful also. Now what I'm gonna do in this case, or what I did is I actually duplicated the layer and I took a duplicate layer and I just took that duplicate layer and I started messing around with the blend mode. So you'll see here that I started modifying up at the very top here, the threshold and the opacity, right? So what I did is I changed the radius. So I tightened up the radius after I pushed the threshold up. So I started going from above and I pushed just the little mounds up and I changed the radius. So I just found a way to accent little bits of it, and then I changed the color of it. So what that does is just really gives me little highlights on the very top of the mounds, in essence, just by going from above and putting a little sand on the top and you know modifying the radius of it. So it feels like sand is accumulating on the top of the mounds. And then I, took some dirt and soil and I put it into the bottom of it by going from below. And you can see that now from below, I'm just kind of pushing up some dirt and soil, right? And so the beautiful procedural workflows that you have here that are all non-destructive. So I've untiled it so I can sort of see what it's doing. And you can see that I can at every point modify the frequency. So if I want that to really be granular dirt coming in and modify the low frequency, I get some real power to, to make a really nice grungy thing. And so once again, all I'm doing is browsing the library, finding interesting stuff. And then I go in and I find some other nice low frequency, high frequency noises. And then I, I use something really great here, which is a from the online library, or I can go in and find imperfections. So these imperfections are great, but so are the atlases. Atlases are these little bits of 
forest branches and chestnut branches or whatever the case is, you know, arid debris. And I think this is what I used here. I used forest, uh, forest floor. And I can bring in just this little debris that's tileable, and I can put it in on the top. Now, one of the things that's really powerful is that if I middle click into my albedo swatch here, it's just going to blend with the colors below it. And now I can bring that up and just darken it so that it blends with the color, but just darkens just a little bit. And so now that blends really well. And if I want to, I can drop the opacity or, or heighten the opacity and change the radius so that it feathers in with everything else below it. And you can see that now it's being applied as a mask as opposed to coming in from above or below. So it'll blend better with anything below it. And once again, I'm constantly hitting the T key to make sure that it tiles well. And I'm constantly moving the light around to see how it's going to blend as a material. And then I bring in some more sand and the sand actually comes in from below and i want that to affect the crack layer to really get into those crack layers some more chipped rocks and then finally i can apply some noise over all of everything and this you know i can bring in just to give me some warble and if i really wanted to get extreme and crazy I can bring in a puddle water layer. And this is really interesting and, and absolutely beautiful. I can change everything about this puddle layer, you know, just to bring a little bit of moisture into the scene, change the radius, change the amount of detail, change the depth of the puddle. So you can do some really interesting stuff with this tool set. And now what's really powerful if you're working with surfaces is that once you're done with it, you can file export to your library, okay? So what's nice about this is that if you export this to your library, I can call this ground number, let's say 10. And I export it to my library and it's gonna show back up here in Bridge. And it'll show up in my local library as a surface. So we give it a minute. And it pops up here after it gets processed. Oh, it's from Mixer here. There it is, Lewis Ground 10. And then I just get to export it directly into my Unreal Engine scene. So the idea of having to go from Brit, from Mixer and then export individual textures, diffuse albedo, and reassemble them in Unreal Engine is an unnecessary step. I can just assemble them and export them, then one click past them back to Unreal Engine just by building them into a, a, into a bridge uh, material and then one click exporting them. So be aware that that is a possibility because now it's available to me here in my surfaces. If I go and find my Megascan folder, surfaces and ground 10 will be available to me somewhere in here it might be here there it is ground 10 so there's my surface so if i go in here on the ground plop it in course the tiling's way off so i'd have to go in and modify the tiling no big deal just change the tiling i think it's 0 0.1 0 0.1 oh see that puddle doesn't really work out so i didn't really use it in the other one 0 0.03 0 0.03 you can see that now i start modifying from here so for the sake of time let's open up the next piece of the pie. By the time I got it to where I wanted it, I started scattering around some other assets into the scene. Now, hand placing assets, how are we doing on time? We got, we got a rush. 
hand placing assets can be a pain in the butt, right? Nobody wants to hand place assets, right? I went and selected a bunch of specific actors to work with. And I found some terrain plates like this, you know, and I found some other uh, various plates like that. And I found, you know, some cool stuff that I wanted to put into the scene, right? Some rocks and stuff like that. But I don't want to hand place this stuff because in some cases it's great. In other cases, if I just want to prototype a scene, it can be very time consuming. So let's build some tools. So that's what I did. I built a little blueprint. And my little blueprint allows me to, uh, let's go find our blueprint. Basically put the blueprint down and it allows me to find what I want to distribute with the blueprint. So let's see, maybe this guy, maybe this one, and just put it in there as the mesh I want to distribute into the environment. And then say, I want a bunch of them and I want to now change the radius of them. And now I can, you know, rotate them around if I want to and plop them into the ground. Right, and I've got all kinds of additional control. I can change the scale so that some of them are a little larger than others and start to munge those into the ground. And that really helps in the placement process, right? So if I want to get rid of these other ones, you can see how quickly you can do this type of set dressing when you have these tools. And there are actually uh, some free plugins in our marketplace that do this at a much higher level of control than this tool that I wrote for myself. But you can see that once you've got it like that, you can go, well, now I hold down the Alt key and drag out a couple of these ground plates. And once I've put them where I want, I can just come down here and change the seed value and rescatter them, right? So this is basically randomizing the work. And you can see I very quickly can populate a whole ground plane. So that's that part of the equation is how to populate the ground plane. And the same thing happens when it comes time to actually populate the outer edge. This is another mesh, but I, I can, of course, go through the process of putting down mesh by mesh but why not write another tool? So this is a spline-based tool. And this spline-based tool allows me to pick another mesh. So here's a mesh for the outer part. And this spline-based tool allows me to draw a spline. And if I hold down the spline, it just keeps drawing that mesh out into the distance. But what's really cool about it is that I can change the height of the meshes. And once again, based on the randomization aspect of it, I can change the look and feel of the way that that mesh gets distributed along the outer edge. And what's really nice about it as well is that if I want to, I can add a spline to it here. And this is a bezier. So if I want one to come forward or one to go back, you know, I get some proceduralism to modify it. This one is the same thing, right? So it is a different mesh munging up with the rocks. And then we do the same thing. We start to paint some foliage, but this is the map in essence with both of those elements painted in. And then here it is with a little bit of lighting and a little bit of foliage painted in and all of it starting to come together. Now, I've added another piece to the equation here. Let me see if I can open up this one here. I've added a little bit of a decal up here. And this is one of those decals that you can push in anywhere you want. This is directly exported from Bridge. 
And, you know, you can scale this decal any way you want. Once again, this is a material, so I can change the color of it. And one of the, the things that I, that I started to do to make this more integrated overall, and I'll rotate the light a little bit so we can see the ground a little bit better, is I utilized runtime virtual textures. And so this is a very powerful technology. And if you go to, let me open up my browser. Let's see, where's my browser here? And if you search for runtime virtual textures with uh, mega scans, you'll see a great blog written by some of our artists at Quixel that talk about how runtime virtual textures work and actually show you the way that the, the networks can be built. And so this is a really great blog because it shows you how the hard seams exist when you put meshes together. But when you use runtime virtual textures, they have a, a really great way of blending meshes together. So here's without blending, and here's with blending in runtime virtual textures. Right? And so this is an amazing technology. And so let me show you how it basically works. I've got in my scene here a runtime virtual texture for basically color. And I'll hit the G key so you can see this is a volume that surrounds my terrain mesh. Here it is. And then a runtime virtual texture for height. And both of them talk to the material. So I had to modify the material. And if I go and select my terrain mesh, you'll see that in my terrain mesh, I also have virtual textures. I've got the color virtual texture and the height virtual texture. So they're basically creating a render target that's going to basically modify the material on the fly. And so if I go to the terrain mesh and I look at the actual material, I now have a runtime virtual texture node on the actor. Let's go find all my runtime virtual textures. And I create a runtime virtual texture terrain material and also a runtime virtual texture actor material and material instances. So if I open up the material instance for the actors, Here's the actor material. This isn't as complicated as it looks. I know this can seem like gibberish to a lot of folks, but for the terrain, you create your material terrain blends, and then you just need to output a runtime virtual texture output node. And for the actor, you basically are going to in, uh, do a linear interpret between the runtime vir virtual texture for color and for height. So this one's evaluating height, you can see here, while this one's evaluating color. And those get blended together with your output node and recombined into your texture. And so what you get from that, if you look here in the scene, is the ability to start blending my material. So you can see here's the mesh, and there's the terrain. What that adds is the ability for me to blend my terrain. Let's see. Do I have the right scene? You can see it actually working on the mesh. Let's see. Do I have the right scene open? I think I need to open up the different scene. Let's see, is that the right one? Are you working? What? Show the people the cool stuff. Don't be the live demo that isn't going to be live. It should be working right there. 
Are you doing the stuff? Hold on here. Maybe it's got the wrong one. There it goes. So now you can see it on this rock here where the runtime virtual texture is going to creep up the side based on how I dial it in. So you can see it blending up the side, and I can change how it feathers. So now the, the rock is actually taking on the material of the terrain. So if I move the rock up the side, you can see the terrain material blending with, and I don't want to dial these parameters up too high or it starts to smear a little bit, but this is a way to integrate terrain with textures. All right. So on the quick, between the, the tools, this is how you quickly assemble an environment like this. Now, let me show you one more thing. I had mentioned uh, the virtual humans, the MetaHuman initiative that we have. So one of the last things that I want to talk about is that MetaHumans and the MetaHuman project is something that's available uh, and that is already something that you can download. So I'm glad I didn't spend any time on this really nice presentation I made. But for those of you who are not familiar with MetaHumans, MetaHumans, uh, you can go and download the MetaHuman project now. MetaHumans is one of the companies like Quixel. Uh, Cubic Motion was acquired by Epic, and they have created the MetaHuman project. And so you can download from the Epic Games launcher the MetaHuman sample, which are two MetaHumans. Uh, and in the next month or two, uh, we are starting to roll out the MetaHuman creator, which will allow you to make you know, hundreds of MetaHumans for game projects and virtual production films and so forth. And these are fully rigged real-time characters that are of unprecedented resolution and capabilities that are, you know, once again, fully articulated and rigged with full facial. And one of the really powerful things is that by also utilizing LiveLink, which is the ability to connect like your phone to Unreal Engine, uh, you can make your metahumans talk very easily. So um, I'll show you very quickly. Uh, I've got a, my iPhone here. And there's an app called Live Link Face. And so if I open up my little, what I did is I migrated a MetaHuman into this project just by taking the MetaHuman sample and migrating the sample into the scene and then placing the MetaHuman into the scene. So just by having my phone connected now the metahuman is talking so if i select the metahuman and i control b it to find the metahuman and i open up the blueprint for the metahuman you can see the metahuman here and as i'm talking the metahuman is talking and the way that this basically works is very simple to do and my phone currently is too close to my face, so that's why I'm sitting here holding it right up to my face. But you can go to select the actual mesh for the MetaHuman. And if you go to the face, you will see that here there's an animation node and you want to connect the face anim blueprint up as the default animation. And then you will probably have to go to that blueprint and double click it. And that will take you to the anim blueprint for the MetaHuman. And there's a variable here to connect your iPhone. Now, one of the things you're gonna have to do on a Windows computer is to go to your IP config and find out what your IP is, and you'll have to plug this into the app on your iPhone, and then you're going to have to bring up LiveLink. And so this is LiveLink, and LiveLink will 
have you find the source. And once you find the source, you're going to find your iPhone. And once you found your iPhone, and once again, this is all in, in a series of videos that are up on our YouTube channel. So this really is very simple because there are two or three videos that are available that walk you through this process. You just connect Live Link as your variable, Lewis's iPhone, and then Presto Magico. Your MetaHuman will be connected. And I'm not saying that it's always going to be the easiest because earlier this morning, she was talking here, and when I compiled it, she was talking in my scene, but now her head is moving and her mouth is not moving. So I got to do something uh, uh, to make her talk in the scene because she's talking perfectly here, but not talking perfectly there. And I've pushed a button somewhere that messed that up. And mostly it was because I was also <clears throat> messing around with another project that's freely available. And this is all with regard to control rig, right? So if I want to bring in these characters into control rig, all I have to do is bring in, this is the um, Meerkat from the Meerkat project, which was a project done by Weta. So what I wanted to experiment with is blending animation inside of Unreal Engine using control rig. And this is the last thing I want to just point out is that it's very powerful to take these animations, right? So I can go in here and find these animations. And here are the animations. These are the animations done by Weta for Meerkat. And you can see that there's some really cool, very powerful animations. And once again, I migrated this from the Weta project. And I brought them into Sequencer. But some of the stuff that I can do here, which is really great, is that I can select all of these animations. And I can actually bake them down to Control Rig. So if I come down here and say, in Control Rig, bake to Control Rig, I get the opportunity to you know, reduce the keyframes and bake them all to control rig. And so now these are actually control rig animations that I have full control over and I get a full rig to work with here. So now everything is now baked down to keyframes, but I also have a full rig to drive my character with. So this is really powerful because now I've got a full curve editor here. So I've got all my transforms for my character moving through the scene. And, and if I want to animate on top of all those animations of this character walking through the scene, I've got that control, including the control rig to drive the character. So incredibly powerful tool set. We're making it even more powerful and easy to drive. The other things you're seeing here is a full real-time fur system on these characters, which is really cool. and. Um, you know, if you think about all the technology that's coming together here, meta humans being driven through Live Link, uh, real time fur, and sequencer driving all this stuff on top of an environment that you can build with photogrammetry in maybe not an hour, but two or three hours, it's pretty nutty. All right. I'm sure there's some questions. Um, I was told it was five minutes, maybe seven or eight minutes ago. There's probably a couple questions. <laughs> Lewis, that was wonderful. It's just amazing the amount of power that is at the artist's uh, you know, tool belt at this moment. And the fact that you're showing so much uh, you know, from uh, various uh, software going from Quixel to MetaHumans just to populate the scene, it's just absolutely amazing. Um, and I know that I really piqued the interest of our students' minds. So this is a great moment that we would love to uh, actually bring in some of our students uh, to uh, ask some of the questions. I know that you probably jolted their imagination as well as their curiosity right now. Fire away. 
I think first coming up, uh, we have Sierra Ely, who is a graduate student from the Interactive Design and Game Development Department. Hi, Sierra. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Sierra Ely, and I'm a grad game design student. And um, regarding mega scans, I've seen that this has become a major player in um, even recently, like animation and AAA games. So I was wondering how you think that mega scan tools like Quixel and MetaHuman are going to change the workload and pipeline for professional environment artists and character artists. Um, so it's. It's, I have to be careful. <laughs> um, it already is changing uh, a lot of workflows. You know, I'm going to talk um, like Quixel, and I'm going to talk like Epic and Unreal Engine, right? So from those of you who are working in Unreal Engine, the idea of, and, and I think this is really important, Get to approval is, is really where you want to go to, right? Um, you want to get to final pixel. You want to get to final approval as quickly as possible, you know, without having to stay up till midnight every night. And so one of the reasons photogrammetry and content libraries are becoming a key part of workflows for every major studio, film studios, game studios, is because they get people's work approved and they're legal, and they're um, unquestionable as a workflow tool, as opposed to, I just want to model it because I want to model it, and I'll stay up till 4 o'clock every morning every day to do the work, right? Uh, because once you get into a studio, it's just about getting final approval and, and getting the work done and, and approved. And so major studios, film companies, you know, they don't do work they don't need to do. And so being able to find assets or having teams that can go and scan assets and then bring them through mixer pipelines or substance pipelines or whatever and modify them to put aging, weathering, uh, modifying them however you want or bring them through Unreal Engine and use the geometry tools in there to not have to break them in Max Maya, Blender, whatever the case is, Houdini, you know, to, to not have to distort the workflows is all about time economy and approval economy. How are you going to get your scene approved without having to spend all your, your free time? Because you know, after you've worked your eight or 10 hours, now you, you're giving away your free time, right? So how do you get to approval? So photogrammetry gets you to approval. We've got enormous companies, you know, you're, Netflix is changing the world because they have so much content and they're changing it because they can have that much content. Same thing with all these streaming services and they're doing it because of a new economy of approval. They can get stuff done and approved faster than in many cases your ILMs and your WETAs. And so the way I answer that question is, is that the reason that we at Quixel have become such a big influence is because you don't need a team of hundreds of people making stuff when you can go find the thing, change it a little bit, and it gets you to approval. So it's for an animator like mocap. Do you spend forever hand keying another walk cycle or do you mocap it and then layer in your personality on it? Thank you, Lewis. Uh, yes, thank you. Before we go back to the uh, general questions, uh, we have one more student that would love to pop in and ask a question as well. Uh, we'd love to uh, welcome um, Tony Dillo, who is also a master's student in the Interactive Design and Game Development Department. And just we just heard that he's going to be launching his first game in on the 15th of this month, which is awesome. Welcome, Tony. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, as he has said, I'm Tony Dillo, a grad student in Interactive Media and Game Design. Um, my question was actually, with the announcement of uh, Unreal Engine 5 and all the tools that are coming, is there anything that you can tell me that Quixel is doing to prepare for that? Uh, now that high poly models are becoming far less of an issue, is Quixel at all concerned with more competition on the market? And what is being done to really push the company into the next generation of Unreal? 
I could tell you, but I'd have to um, kill myself. <laughs> That's politically incorrect. Uh, no, um, I will just encourage you to not hold your breath for too long. Because now, because Quixel is part of Epic, uh, you know, it, what do you think Quixel is doing? You know, Quixel has announced the acquisition of Capturing Reality, which all the assets in the Quixel library are, are processed using Capturing Reality. What does Epic do when technology is acquired? Um, yes. The answer is yes. Epic, Quixel is absolutely prepared for the launch of Unreal Engine 5, and that's all I can tell you. And awesome. just wait and see what that means. Looking forward to it. Thank you. You're welcome. I know that we uh, in the ITGM department are always using Unreal and we're on tethers to see what is going to be coming um, out very soon. And, um, you know, we are always very excited about that. Uh, I want to take this time to come back to some of the questions in our general audience and be able to maybe pick your brain and rewind a little bit throughout our session because that was a lot of information and we're always grateful for it. Uh, let's see, I'm going to try to combine some of these because there's some common threads. So uh, Christian Wins as well as Patrick Johnson and Fani Teja Koti had all mentioned some uh, concerns on where is the processing load, where is it going to be? Is it on the software side, is it on the hardware side? Should they be concerned about running it on a laptop with uh, Unreal Engine and Quixel, or should they get a beefed up machine? So I think if some of our general audience, also from the beginning points, would love to get some um, insights on that. Uh, Louis, would you be able to share a little bit more on how that, uh, that would relate to our developers? Yes. Um, I would say that, you know, I'll, I'll go back to what you're seeing, the companies that Epic is acquiring and the technologies that it's sharing once again for free and, and all those things. You know, you look at Fortnite, um, and, and this is how I would encourage everyone to sort of look at Epic. Okay, you look at Fortnite, and Fortnite runs on very low-end mobile devices, and it runs on PlayStation 5s and very high-end PCs. We have tuned and tailored the engine to do that. Uh, the engine is capable of delivering on low-end low Android devices um, and on high-end, you know, consoles and PCs. So you can do whatever you need to do with the tool set. But you look at the nature of the special projects work that come out of Epic, like, you know, working with Wet on the Meerkat project or um, the MetaHumans project. The MetaHumans sample will run on your computer, but the MetaHumans creator is um, yet to be determined really how everyone will access it, right? So uh, it's very likely it will run on virtual machines and people will log into virtual machines to run it. And then you will download your, your MetaHuman. Um, my advice is save your money, invest in a, a really powerful machine because we are not racing to the bottom. We're racing to the top. Uh, we're racing to the... the we're racing, you know, go and Google Tim Sweeney and what his vision is. His vision is the metaverse, right? And so the metaverse will probably not run on a, on a handheld device or, or a version of it will, you know, the output will, but not the development of it. The development of the metaverse is not going to happen on low-end hardware. The development of the metaverse will happen on high-end hardware. If you want to develop the metaverse, get high-end hardware. Because what did you just see? A metahuman talking to a you know a, a meerkat that can be animated, you know, in an environment that you can build in a little while, you know, from a content library that's growing exponentially with free content. This is the beginning of the metaverse, and you know, from a company that made one of the biggest games ever made that is well funded. This is the metaverse coming, 
and it's democratized, not with, you know, um, paywalls, you know, from companies that are, we are currently at an under litigation with, it's going to be open and free. Well, speaking of free content, um, I think one of the aspects that we're just amazed by is just how readily available all this is for anybody that will download the Unreal Engine and play with it. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a student, Philippe, Felipe Amaya, asking just to share on the background, um, if, you, if you're if you aware of how long does it take to produce an asset in um, in the Quixel Megascan library um, for something, I, I know it's going to depend on a variation, but say, you know, a um, a 1000 year old oak tree to like, what what kind of um, assets and how long does it take to produce to get into the library? Um, it, it can take not very long. A lot of the process is automated. In other words, there, um, the capturing reality team. So we have a we have a significant team in Pakistan that does this. That is part of Quixel. Uh, one of the founders is based in Pakistan, so he's got a team there. And so uh, we just had a team in Moab, uh, and the the um, what's the name of that library pack? So the the Moab pack. I, I don't remember the proper name of it. They were out there with drones and scanners and they scanned hundreds of assets in, in Moab and two weeks later it was in the Megascans library. So um, part of, you know, all of it goes to capturing reality. It goes in and the, the biggest challenge isn't actually processing the data. It's cataloging and all the information that has to be put into the metadata when you actually capture it on the spot. Uh, and then that goes to an automated process that actually using capturing reality um, processes everything and then outputs things. And then, then there's QA processes that gets them into the library. It doesn't really take long. It takes more than anything human effort to make sure that everything's right and, and once it gets in the library. One thing I didn't show you is that in the metadata, there's a place for everyone to report an issue with an asset. If you guys are working with any of the content in the Megascans library and you're like, oh, this looks weird, there's some bad UVs over here or whatever, you can report anything about any of Megascans library and there's a team that will go in and address those issues. Uh, but I think there were literally 60 some assets from Moab that were processed in two weeks. It's, it's not a long process and mostly because it's all driven uh, by software only QA and and, um, and administered by humans. Thank you very much. Um, I'm always uh, just fascinated uh, with your presentations. And um, as uh, Professor Shami had noted, uh, we, uh, you know, anybody that's worked with Lewis will know that, that he loves to use food analogies. Uh, and everything that you're showing, um, I know we're talking about a pie, but this is, I, I like your earlier analogy of how be a myth of, a, uh, a amount of information there is. Uh, so this is uh, one of the things that we want to thank you for giving us that insight to all the small pieces of the cogs that are moving, but in, uh, in synchronicity of building a, a larger picture. Uh, this is all the time we have for today for questions. And Louis, I just want to say thank you so much. You really opened our minds and we hope to be able to bring you back and sometime in the future to be able to pick a little bit more on each of the nuances that's unfolding for Quixel Megascans scans to metahumans. Again, thank you for everything you've been able to share. Oh, it's my pleasure. Hope to see you again soon. That would be wonderful. Um, so for those of you who are in the audience, uh, we want to thank you for your time. But uh, you know, this is a two day festival. So we're just getting started. Uh, if you have time, please go into and take a look at our SCAD alumna, Jolie Menzo, who will be talking about narrative design in the three, at the 3 p.m. Eastern time session, followed by another esteemed alumni presentation by Jeff White, who's going to give an incredible presentation on his work with Industrial Light and Magic. And don't forget, at 6 p.m. is our Spotlight Award honoree with Will Wheaton, who will be in conversation with our own Professor Michael Cheney. Check out the festival schedule for everything we have planned. And everyone, enjoy the festival. Thank you so much. Thank you all.